right now on Fox 13 News at 9. Leaders and experts react to former President Donald Trump's indictment by a New York grand jury. What Mr. Trump is saying about this historic move. It takes too long to get to this point to get closure like that. It will be, it will be a while to get back to my life again. The jury found Gwyneth Paltrow not at fault for the ski collision that happened in 2016. Here's what both legal teams had to say. Get ready for more snow tonight as we're in for part two of our storm. We'll see some travel impacts for the morning drive. Plus, what can you expect for the rest of the weekend? Your forecast is coming up. He collapsed on the football field at Utah State University when athletic trainers acted without hesitation. Every doctor I've spoken to during the last week said that the CPR 100, 110% saved my life. Hear more from my conversation with Josh Davis and what doctors are doing to determine why a young, healthy athlete suffered such a major heart event. Live from Utah's news leader, Fox 13 News at 9 starts right now. Well, this is definitely history in the making because you don't have that in the history of the United States that a former president has been indicted. It's shocking to say the least. It's, a, it's not a surprise, though, from what we've seen in the last few weeks. A New York grand jury indicted former President Donald Trump today in connection with a hush money payment to adult film star Stormy Daniels. Thanks for joining us tonight. I'm Bob Evans. This indictment is still sealed. The details of it will likely be released in the coming days. Reaction is pouring in from Mar-a-Lago to Congress. Fox's Caroline Shively reports from Washington. Mr. Trump's attorneys say he committed no crimes and they pledged to fight these charges in court. Authorities in New York City on high alert following the revelation a grand jury voted to indict former President Trump. The charges relate to a hush money payment made to adult film star Stormy Daniels. It's a raw political prosecution. Now, the indictment may come out with a crime that none of us have heard of. Accusations against Mr. Trump stem from his former attorney, Michael Cohen, paying Daniels $130,000 to remain quiet over an alleged sexual encounter with the former president. The grand jury was deciding whether Trump falsified business documents when his company reported the reimbursement to Cohen as legal expenses. Former President Trump reacted in a statement calling the indictment political persecution and election interference at the highest level in history. Most Republicans are rallying to his side. I think this is going to backfire on the Democrats. And again, we know that Trump is a fighter. He leans into the fight. He's not going to go anywhere. Democrats, meanwhile, are praising the move arguing accountability is long overdue. I would caution those who, who, who believe that President Trump is being politically persecuted here to not persecute our judicial and legal system. President Trump has vowed an indictment will not stop his 2024 presidential campaign. In Washington, Caroline Shively, Fox 13 News, Utah. After almost two weeks, a jury found actress Gwyneth Paltrow not at fault for a ski collision in 2016 at Deer Valley. Fox 13 News reporter Maithili Gubi followed the trial from the beginning and spoke to both sides after the verdict today. Was Gwyneth Paltrow at fault? No. Actress celebrity Gwyneth Paltrow sat in a courtroom in Park City for eight days facing a lawsuit for a ski collision in Deer Valley in 2016. The jury Excuse listened to testimony from Paltrow, for the man suing her for damages, Terry Sanderson, experts, friends and family, reaching a verdict deciding in her favor. I couldn't be more disappointed, right? It's been a long, hard battle, so... Um, but we fought the good fight. I got heard, right? I got heard. That meant a lot to me. Terry Sanderson claimed that it was Paltrow crashing into him on the slopes that caused permanent brain damage and broken ribs. Paltrow said it was Sanderson who crashed into her. The jury decided that the collision was Terry's fault. What amount fairly com compensates Gwyneth Paltrow for economic damages? One dollar. Terry Sanderson filed a suit in 2019, but says he feels like a different person since the collision because of all uh, the emotional and mental back. changes that came with Witness brain damage. The bottom is not filled I out. listened to that whole thing about how it was characterized, and it wasn't just about the action, was it wasn't. It's about the character. They drug that character in there. And, you know, um, 
yeah, I wish I could have that back. But when you go down this, I didn't realize that when you go down this, this row, I thought it'd be about a ski accident that I knew I had the truth, the absolute facts, and it wasn't about that. It, it turned out it was about the narrative of about the life I've lived, things said that absolutely were not true, and I'll never get a chance to change that. Paltrow left the courtroom after the verdict was announced, but her legal team shared a statement. We're pleased with this outcome and appreciate the judge and jury's thoughtful handling of this case. Gwyneth has a history of advocating for what she believes in. This situation was no different, and she will continue to stand for what she believes is right. Did Gwyneth Paltrow say something to you as she left? She did. I wish you well, she said to me. None of the jurors wanted to speak to us after the trial, but both legal teams say that they're thankful for the jury's work and that they patiently sat through eight days of testimony to reach a verdict. In Park City, I am Mike Legal B, Fox 13 News, Utah. Switching gears to weather now, and right now, I-80 eastbound in Parley's Canyon is closed because of all the snow falling in the area, and you can see just how intense it is. The traffic coming toward us is westbound. This is a live look uh, from one of our UDOT cameras, and I'll tell you what, Allison, Mother Nature just keeps pounding and pounding and pounding. That's right. I think there was some ice also. I was watching the cameras over the last couple of hours, and you could really see a shiny road out there before this heavy snowfall currently started coming down. So what we're tracking for you across the valleys right now, areas of snowfall, but we're expecting this to pick up in intensity in a couple of hours. Right now, it's still pretty widely scattered areas of flurries from Bountiful up through Layton, some areas of moderate snowfall up towards Brigham City and Tremont and Cache Valley as well. Areas of snow currently coming down Park City. As we look at the bigger picture here across the state, we will continue with areas of snowfall mainly for the mountains of southern Utah, but we did let the winter weather advisories for the southern mountains expire at nine o'clock. So all that's left is now for central Utah mountains, winter weather advisories, winter weather advisories that just kicked in for the Wasatch Front and winter storm warnings continue for the northern mountains. More on what to expect through the rest of the evening and for your morning drive in the forecast. Allison, thanks so much. Last Thursday, Utah State football player Josh Davis suffered a heart-stopping major medical emergency during spring training. Yesterday, he was released from the hospital. Today, he shared his story publicly for the first time. Fox 13 News anchor Kelly Chapman spoke one-on-one -on -one with him about his incredible recovery. Josh Davis did suffer an unexplained seizure last September, but was cleared by doctors to return to his sport. But what happened on March 23rd was a play nobody was expecting. Exactly a week ago, I was lying on the field fighting for my life. And now I'm able to walk into this room and talk to all of you. 19 year old freshman wide receiver uh, Josh all, Davis speaking publicly for the first side, time Thursday at a press conference after collapsing exactly a week prior from cardiac arrest in front of his teammates, coaches, and thankfully a skilled and ready training staff. Um, every doctor I've spoken to during the last week said that the CPR 100, 110% saved my life. Recalling what he can on what was supposed to be a regular day of spring drills for the Utah State football team. Oh, I had no feeling at all. Um, Beforehand, yeah, no indicators at all. Josh told me in a Zoom call he was putting on his gear when everything went black. On the field, teammates taking a knee as athletic trainers not only started life-saving CPR, but also hooked Josh up to an AED to start his heart. All of this uh, as his head coach, Blake it. Anderson, stood over Josh screaming words of encouragement. So I knew Josh couldn't respond, but I wasn't gonna quit. I wasn't gonna give up on him and he wasn't giving up. Stabilized, Josh was rushed to Logan Regional Hospital and later transferred to McKady Hospital in Ogden. Every doctor I talked to at the hospital said it's a miracle. He's not supposed to survive this. A survivor, but still a mystery as to why Josh, a young, healthy athlete, suffered such a major heart event. Yeah, so there was a bunch of tests that we did um, at the hospital, and I think they're still going to be doing some more genetic testing kind of as we go. But as of right now, they, they really couldn't pinpoint anything. And while Josh's college game plan has changed. From what the doctors have been saying, uh, as far as like a future for football, it's the short answer is, is probably not playing again. 
Josh's life is going to change moving forward, but he's still going to be part of our family. And if they tell him he can never run or pass route again or catch another ball, we'll find something else for him to do. A lesson learned bigger than any game. Life is not promised. Uh, it's a gift. Be, uh, be grateful for every opportunity you get. With a win that will forever be remembered on Merlin Olson Field, at Utah State University. I'm just just so blessed for everyone that's you know said prayers. My family back home, all my my family out here. Um, yeah, and just thank God for for everything that's happened because it, it really is is a miracle. So I'm very thankful. Josh's parents, Chrissy and Matt, were at Thursday's press conference. They've been in town from Carlsbad, California, since last week, of course, to be with their son. Matt did announce an endowment fund is being set up to support the USU sports medicine team as a thank you to the university's medical and training staff, led by Mike Williams, Brady Molnar, and Kendra Gilmore, the three people he credits for saving his son Josh's life. The Davis family also making an undisclosed monetary donation. We do have a link on our website, Fox 13 Now com if you would like to donate as well in the newsroom kelly chapman fox 13 news utah wow wow life is a gift mm -hmm. it isn't promised it's a gift now you allison found an incredibly cool connection today with yeah jo that's Josh right davis. so this picture that you're seeing here davis is on the left you and usu basketball player danny berger former basketball players on the right and then the head athletic trainer mike williams is standing in the middle so Mike was there for both of these guys when they had sudden cardiac arrests on oh, the practice my field. Goodness. So Berger suffered a cardiac arrest during a practice back in 2012, so more than 10 years ago. And Mike in the middle was there for that. And they saved performed his CPR life and, and they brought an AED out for both of them. That's incredible. All three of them were able to meet up today. Danny stays in touch with Mike in the middle, and Danny was telling wow. me that just proves how important CPR and AEDs are. And he also told me that he's happy Josh is in the picture, yep. but he doesn't want anybody else to join this club. <laughs> yeah, yeah, this is not a club you want to join. No. Boy, congratulations. But... Well, Mike, way to go, bud. Yes, yeah, CPR and go. AEDs saving lives, and they're so important. Had I not stood up, I would have, I would be dead. Coming up, a terrifying scenario in St. George when a woman is shot by a stray bullet in her apartment. What she says about the incident and to the man who fired the gun. And a Morgan Middle Schooler wants to make his community proud in the World Championships of Irish Dancing. We'll introduce you to him and show you his moves a little later. Welcome back. Taylorsville police need your help finding 13-year-old Kane Aranda Bengay. He was last seen at 11 Tuesday night. Police believe he is headed to Tucson. He is 4 foot 5, has greenish brown eyes and black hair. They say he was wearing a black jacket, black sweats, black shoes and carrying a black backpack. If you have seen him or know where he is, call Taylorsville police. Take a look at the aftermath of an excavator in the parking lot of the Canyons Village at the Park City Mountain Resort. It apparently fell off that flatbed trailer and onto those cars. The resort confirms it happened on their property, but says the excavator is owned and operated by a third party rental company. We will update you as we learn more about this. A St. George woman is in the hospital tonight after being shot in her apartment by a neighbor's stray bullet. Fox 13 News reporter Darian DeBrule spoke with the woman about the moments leading up to and following getting shot. Had I not stood up, I would, have, I would be dead. Chrissy Wilmot has always had a fear of being shot. Last Friday, her fear became reality. i just gotten home from work, was going to the bathroom and had my phone in there, was playing with my phone and I stood up to finish going to the bathroom and felt, felt like an electrical socket blew up. That's what I could hear. And so I didn't understand what was going on, but I knew I was having a hard time breathing, so I called 911. 
Wilmot was lying on her couch trying to understand what happened when her neighbor came to the door. He had gunpowder on his hand and was telling me that he accidentally discharged his firearm. At that moment, Wilmot realized she had been shot in her left ab. It went through my pancreas, stomach, liver, and then it stuck in the in the right side. They're just waiting for it to encapsulate in the see where it goes from there. The probable cause statement says police believe Wilmot's neighbor was under the influence of alcohol at the time of the accidental discharge. His blood alcohol concentration was 0 0.075. He was arrested for reckless endangerment, discharge of firearm or weapon in city limits and intoxication. All misdemeanor charges, but Wilmot and her family are worried the charges aren't enough. Chrissy didn't deserve this by any means. She already has enough that she's dealt with medically for years. She really didn't need something else added to her plate. I hope that something gets upgraded to a felony instead of just misdemeanors. I have to deal with this the rest of my life. So I feel like he should have something yeah. more than just a slap on the wrist. Darian DeBrule, Fox 13 News, Utah. Now, if you want to support Wilmot in her recovery, we have a link to her GoFundMe page on our website, fox13now.com. For the first time since 2020, no part of Utah is in extreme drought. This map was released today and there is no more red. The part of the state in severe drought in orange also shrunk from about a third of the state last week to about 20% tonight. And I'll tell you what, Allison, uh, we'll take it. A lot more precipitation on the way for this evening. So if your morning drive tomorrow very well could have a tough start to your Friday. Areas of snow still currently coming down here in the valley is going to get going here over the next couple of hours. 38 in Salt Lake, 38 for Ogden, 34 in Provo right now. For the Wasatch Front commute tomorrow morning, expecting areas of snow. And for tomorrow evening, mostly cloudy temperatures in the mid 40s. So here's what we currently have going on. Winter weather advisories that just kicked in for the Wasatch Front Valleys. This also includes the Cache Valley, our I-15 corridor from the Idaho border down through Ogden, Layton, Salt Lake, into Utah County, Provo, all the way down towards Spanish Fork and Tooele. One to three inches of snow for most valley locations. Benches four to ten inches. Wasatch back, Ogden Valley also looking at four to 10 inches. Winter storm warnings for the mountains of Utah in effect still through nine o'clock tomorrow night. 10 to 18 plus inches of snow. Cottonwood Canyons could see another two feet of snow and winter weather advisories for the central mountains down towards Joe's Valley through noon tomorrow, 6 to 12 more inches of snow. Now across northern Utah right now, here's what we're currently seeing. Areas of snowfall moving through south end of the Salt Lake Valley right now. Sandy Draper up towards the Cottonwood Canyons, Wasatch back. Looks like we're getting a little bit of a break in Parley's Canyon, but ice was a concern a few hours ago, and that's why they ended up shutting down eastbound I-80. So what we're tracking for you this evening will continue to be snowfall really filling into the overnight hours. Take a look at your screen right here. Now, Provo, you're the blue line, so you're looking at mainly scattered to numerous showers 2 a.m. through about 9 a.m. Now for Salt Lake City, we're the red line. We pop up at midnight through about 1, 2, 3 a.m. We are numerous to widespread for our areas of snow showers through late morning tomorrow. And for Ogden, you become numerous at midnight, widespread areas of snow early tomorrow morning during the morning drive. So very well, we'll see some travel impacts tomorrow morning. Temperatures 25 to 35 here across the state for your Friday morning. Temperatures in the 30s tomorrow morning in Salt Lake. Snow is likely. Could maybe even see some rain mixing in by midday. And it'll be breezy throughout the day tomorrow. We're going to have temperatures about 45 to 55 here across Utah with breezy conditions. So we're going to have another gusty day tomorrow. Not as bad as it was earlier in the week, but 60 tomorrow in St. George, close to 70 this weekend. Then cooling down next week, back close to 50 by next Tuesday. So enjoy the warmer weather this weekend. For Salt Lake, 46 tomorrow, likely snow and breezy. Breezy on Saturday, partly cloudy. Enjoy that because look at our temperatures by next Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. We are back close to only 40 degrees for a high here in Salt Lake, and that is below average by 20 degrees. So we're going to have more cool weather on the way. We'll talk more about snow totals coming up. Allison, thanks so much. Coming up, there has been a rise in stolen mail.
in Salt Lake's Rose Park neighborhood. What police want you to know to keep your mail safe. And Utah gets more than 100 new Americans. We'll take you to today's naturalization ceremony in Ogden, where you'll meet some of your new neighbors. Salt Lake police are reminding you to keep an eye on your mailbox after a recent uptick in mail theft, most recently in the Rose Park neighborhood. Earlier this week, police were sent to this or were sent this video of someone checking mailboxes near the golf course in Rose Park. They're especially concerned as we enter the final weeks of tax season with many people getting their refund checks in the mail. It's a crime of opportunity and they're just taking whatever's in there, sorting through it and taking what they want to keep and probably disposing the rest. Also, we still see, uh, you know, issues with uh, uh, our, those package thefts. And so, again, make sure that you're available if you're expecting something or find someone that you trust to be able to receive those packages or those pieces of mail on your behalf. Police also recommend you consider the U.S. Postal Service's informed delivery program, which notifies you when you can expect any given piece of mail in your mailbox on any given day. The city of Ogden hosted the swearing-in of more than 100 new American citizens today. It was at Union Station this morning. 125 people took the oath of allegiance and now bear all the responsibilities and privileges of U.S. citizenship. Now they'll be able to vote in local and national elections. I'm excited for that, especially as a teacher, to be a participant in the school board, um, to vote. Oh my goodness, what an amazing privilege it is to vote. So voting is a really important thing, especially that it's coming up now in November. There's a lot of things that I feel like that needs to be changed in the our, in our state and our communities, and the best way to do it is go out there and vote. Yep, we welcome all their new voices. This is the first time the city of Ogden has hosted a naturalization ceremony. Six police officers under investigation for an arrest that took place in 2019. Some ask, why is it happening now? Others ask, why is it happening at all? Clearfield business owners in shock after learning their licensing fee prices are going way up. Coming up, I take their concerns to the city to figure out why this is the case. wish that your office had the opportunity to screen this for misdemeanor charges? Of course. Yesterday, we told you how six Salt Lake City police officers have been under investigation for weeks because of an arrest they made in 2019. Now, the Salt Lake County District Attorney is explaining why he is not charging any of those six officers with a crime. Fox 13 News investigative reporter Adam Herbetz found out why Sim Gill agrees something needs to change at the police department. We've had like tons of people hit and killed on the streets because people don't wait for the lights. I'm sorry, I thought, I thought I did something like wrong. It normally does not take six officers to handle a jaywalker, but it does when they run. Three and a half years later, now all six of these officers are facing an investigation from their own department, but they will not be charged criminally. You're entitled to use a uh, reasonable force. District Attorney Sim Gill said by the time Salt Lake City became aware of its own case, the statute of limitations for a misdemeanor charge had passed, so he couldn't make a decision one way or the other. Either way, he says none of the officers committed a felony we are going to be scrutinized, and rightfully so. These kind of encounters happen uh, thousands of times. More than a dozen current and former officers all say, after watching the body camera video, they agree. A person who is under arrest should put their arms out. Those arrests and use of force in that nature happen all the time. Matt Evans is a former internal affairs sergeant. He says Chief Mike Brown shouldn't have ever placed the officers on leave. But even if he did, it should not have been three and a half years later. He's reactionary. He's going to go overboard, right, to show he's doing something. Several sources with close ties to the case say this captain, John Beaner, stuck up for the officers in a meeting with the chief. Then he was placed under investigation 
for the second time this year. It just demoralizes the officers. And other officers would be like, that could happen to me. What procedures do you have in place proactively? I think we have an obligation to explain, be truthful, be open about the decisions that we make. Did you communicate that to the chief when you spoke to him? I've communicated that to every chief for the last 12 years, 14 years. Despite promising change has already been made, the chief declined all interviews and admitted there hasn't been any written changes to policy. On Wednesday night, he sent this email to his officers, upset with anyone working with Fox 13 to release public information. Our department did not release nor confirm the identities of our employees. I am very disappointed this information was released and used. How dare the news report the news, you know? <laughs> this just shows that time and time again, he tries to make something else the scapegoat. He's never consistent. He does what he wants to do in the moment. Officers say the chief has lost the trust of his own department. According to a canine officer who didn't want to give their name due to fear of retaliation, he publicly called us out and did exactly what he's accusing Fox 13 of. He has no integrity and he makes us sick. They call him the hand ringer for a reason. He always, you know, just worries and doesn't like to make decisions or, you know, pass it off onto somebody else. If you'd like to see the full letter of Chief Mike Brown talking about how he's disappointed with his officers for speaking with the media, we'll have the whole thing on our website, fox13now.com. For now, reporting downtown, Adam Herfetz. Fox 13 News, Utah. We have an update now. One man has been arrested on suspicion of DUI after a crash yesterday afternoon in Logan Canyon that took the lives of three people. The Utah Highway Patrol says a Kia Rio and a Ford Excursion were both either on or right next to the center line as the road curved. The Kia swerved into oncoming traffic or into the oncoming lane, hitting the Ford Head on. UHP says the roads were dry at the time near Bear Lake, and it appears the Kia driver may have been distracted. Two adults and a 17-year-old in the Kia were killed. A family identified them as sisters Jordan and Jerrica Erickson, and Jordan's fiance Dakota. Another adult and a baby in that car were seriously hurt. The driver of the Ford, 29-year-old Kylan Romrell, was treated on scene for minor injuries. A breath test showed he had a blood alcohol level of 0.216, more than four times the legal limit. A stark increase in business license fees in Clearfield has left business owners in shock. Fox 13 News reporter Lucy Nelson looked into why the sudden increase and how it impacts the city and businesses. Karen Blackwell owns Beans Coffee in Clearfield. While she wouldn't trade it for the world, she says being a small and local business owner isn't easy. It's extremely difficult. I'll be honest, it's really difficult. Right now, it's a very um, tumultuous time because there's so many unknowns. Then came another unknown twist. She saw a Facebook post from a Clearfield convenience store owner who received a letter from the city noting a hefty increase in business license fees. At first, it was shock. Um, I, I was very surprised because the first I heard about it, I, I haven't even seen a letter yet for mine. I've been traveling, so it might be in my coffee shop mailbox. For a convenience store owner, the price of a business license will be raised by nearly $5,000 by 2024. And for Blackwell's coffee shop, up by hundreds of dollars from her original $150 price tag per year. $695 is a huge hit to a little business like mine. Why this much money and why now? I went to the city to find out. This is something that we've recognized needed to be done for a long time. City manager J.J. Allen says they launched a study the first time they had done so since 2008, which was also the last time business license fees were raised. Convenience stores are going up a lot more than like salons or dance studios, mostly because of the police costs, because we respond to a lot more calls at like 7-Eleven versus the salon next door. The study analyzed the disproportionate costs of police calls for businesses. A restaurant came to $695 on average, while a convenience store was $5,476. Allen says the decision was made with taxpayers and crucial city services for everyone in mind. The reality is, for all of these years, the 
the residents, the taxpayers of Clearfield have been subsidizing that because the business license fees for all these years have been artificially low. Blackwell says as a citizen of Clearfield, she has mixed feelings about the change. I do understand needing to fund the city, but there are a lot of taxes that we already pay as a, as a business, things like that. So I was just very shocked to see such a significant increase. She just wishes she wasn't lumped in with other restaurants. My needs with, I don't know, 50 customers maybe per day is a lot different than say a larger actual restaurant with hundreds of customers per day. And that there was more communication from the city in advance. We could have known about this last year that there was a problem, but let us have some input. You may not may not listen to it, right? But at least our voices were heard. In Clearfield, Lucy Nelson, Fox 13 News, Utah. Post-pandemic, America's public schools have more than a million fewer students, but Utah stands out in another big way. We'll show you. And coming up tonight, we are tracking areas of snow right now here across northern Utah. But what about for your Friday morning commute? The details coming up. Fewer children are enrolled in public schools across the country this year compared to 2019. But the pandemic has not had the same impact in Utah. Fox 13 News anchor Max Roth goes in-depth tonight on a new report from scholarship resource site Scholaroo. Utah has always had more children per capita than any other state, but Utah stands out in other ways when it comes specifically to public education. More than a million fewer students in public schools nationwide, but Utah did not contribute to the decline. While Utah's public schools welcomed 4.7% more students from 2019 to 2023, our neighbors in New Mexico saw a decrease of 8.5%. Colorado schools had four 4.3% fewer students, and moving west in California, their 5% loss amounts to more than 300,000 fewer students. There's one clear difference Utah always has. Big families mean a young population, but there is more to it. Utah relies on public schools more than most other states. Nationwide, 11% of children in schools attend private schools. In Utah, that number is 5%. Most states with such low private enrollment can't support private schools because they're rural. People are too spread out. But Utah's population is highly concentrated on the Wasatch Front and in Logan and St. George. So it's the economics of larger families that put private schools out of reach. And it's also the culture of neighborhood-based religious congregations that make nearby schools more appealing to many. That could also explain why Utah homeschools at the same rate as the nation, 6%. These trends suggest that pandemic or no, Utah has continued and will continue to confront the perennial challenge of funding school for more students than any other state. In studio, Max Roth, Fox 13 News, Utah. A Morgan middle schooler is taking his love and passion for Irish dance to the world stage. Who's ready for some baseball? We'll hear from the Salt Lake Bees before tomorrow's season opener coming up in sports. And the Red Rocks had two perfect tens in the second round of the NCAA championship. Was it enough to advance to the regional final? It's just been such a beautiful gymnast all season long. Welcome back. We have a warning tonight for drivers planning to travel through Davis County. Expect to see some closures this weekend. UDOT will be closing southbound I-15 between Park Lane in Farmington and Parish Lane in Centerville as progress continues on the new West Davis Highway. The closures will take place nightly starting at 930 tomorrow night. Crews are building a bridge connecting the highway to the northbound lanes of I-15. During this time, we'll be raising four beams up over uh, southbound I-15. To continue this work, we need to get four more beams during the week raised. But those closures will occur Monday night through Thursday, where we'll have the road down to one lane each direction, and we'll only be raising one beam each night so that we can open up again quickly and have all the traffic open by 5 a.m. Drivers will be detoured onto Legacy Parkway during the closure. 
A Morgan middle schooler is getting the chance of a lifetime to showcase his love for Irish dance on the world stage. Fox 13 News reporter Chris Arnold caught up with the eighth grader tonight as he prepares to head to Canada for the World Irish Dancing Championships later this week. I really like the rhythms and timings of the dance. It is here, inside the Legacy School of Dance in Layton, where Logan Doherty's passion for Irish dancing is on full display. I just think it's a very beautiful form of dance. The 14-year-old eighth grader from Morgan Middle School has been tapping and moving across the dance floor for more than a decade. It's definitely one of the harder forms of body percussion dance. Since he was just three years old. My mother was dancing since before I was born and she put all my siblings in dance. It was me wanting to share my passion of something that I really loved. Christy Doherty is Logan's mom and the owner of Legacy School of Dance, which specializes in Irish dance. It's been great just to watch his progress and as it's become more of a uh, internal motivation for him, it's been great to watch him take the lead and want to really yeah, succeed. Logan's success has led him to place high enough in a regional competition to qualify for a spot in the World Irish Dancing Championships in Montreal beginning next week. It's basically the Olympics for Irish dancing and uh, there will be 2,100 dancers and an estimated over 10,000 spectators at this event. Logan's coach preparing him for the world stage is older brother Ethan who competed in the same event in Germany back in 2014. I push him quite hard, not just because I'm his brother, but just because I, I see a lot of potential in him that um, I wish I could have had as well. I have weekly lessons more than once a week. As he gets ready to compete north of the border, he has the full support of his family, like his sister Amber Lee, who will be there in person to watch him take the stage. I'm really proud of him. I started a couple years before he did, and he passed me up real fast. Well, he says he's competitive and the goal is to win, Logan told Fox 13 News his hope for his first appearance in the World Championships. We do the first two rounds and then they recall the top half or 50% and they do the third round. And I'm just, my goal is to recall and get in that top 50%. Well, Logan and his family will head to Montreal on Saturday where he will ultimately take the stage in Worlds on Monday. In Layton, Chris Arnold, Fox 13 News, Utah. You know, the thing about Irish dancers is that they actually wear uh, socks that come all the way up to their knees, but they don't stay there. I mean, that is a workout. Because they're constantly banging their foot on the door. I mean, seriously, I, I wonder just how many calories they burn per hour in those practices. Like, it's you're constantly moving your muscles. Yeah, and Logan's going to do so well. Oh, we, yes. we wish him the very best. Best of luck. We can't wait to follow up on that story. Yeah. But we're tracking for you here tonight. You can see some flurries currently coming down. Salt Lake Tribune camera. So this is downtown Salt Lake right now. It's 38 here in Salt Lake, so it's cold across the board. And right now we've got a few areas of snow currently coming down, but it's going to become a bit heavier overnight, and we are expecting travel impacts for the morning drive. Right now we've got that snow coming down Lehigh Alpine right now. American Fork Canyon starting to come down there up towards the Cottonwoods. And what we're going to be tracking into the overnight hours, areas of snow, as we were just looking at downtown Salt Lake City, the Tribune camera right in the middle of downtown. That's where we're going to continue seeing some snow filling in over the next couple of hours all along the Wasatch Front. And then for the central mountains, we'll still see some additional accumulations. Southern mountains, your winter weather advisory was allowed to expire at 9 o'clock tonight. But the rest of us, we're going to keep those alerts going through tomorrow morning. 10 o'clock tonight into tomorrow morning. 20 to 35 for much of the state. Okay, we're going to keep the bulk of the snow in northern Utah. Areas of heavy snowfall tonight, especially for the mountains. We've had a lot of problems in Parley's Canyon over the last couple of hours. We initially started seeing very shiny roads, icy roads. I was hearing from people who were saying it was just an absolutely treacherous drive. They ended up shutting down I-80 eastbound and that was expected to reopen at 9.30, so we'll have to check in on that, let you know if that's back open or not. But we're looking at chances of precipitation for tomorrow, likely in Ogden, and then again as we wrap up the weekend and head into early next week. For Provo, your chance of precipitation tomorrow is more scattered than us here in Salt Lake and up in Ogden, but by Sunday night and Monday, we are back to likely conditions. 
And for St. George, we're going to have mainly dry conditions this weekend. Should be actually really nice weather, close to 70 in St. George this weekend. And then a few more chances for rain and snow to return across the state next week. So as we look at future cast tonight here in Salt Lake County and along the Wasatch Front, by midnight, we're tracking a wintry mix for Salt Lake Valley becoming widespread snowfall heading into the overnight hours. So by five o'clock tomorrow morning, we're really going to see some areas of consistent snowfall. By lunchtime tomorrow, we, we could be back to a wintry mix and then we're going to see some clearing. So additional snow now through tomorrow afternoon, we're going to see potentially up to 20 inches of snow for the top of the Cottonwood Canyons. Most valley locations, especially Salt Lake and further north, Salt Lake County and further north, we're looking at one to three inches of snow, benches four to 10, and we'll still see a little bit of snow coming down through our central mountains. Now for St. George, I mentioned really nice weather this weekend. Take a look at that close to 70 on Saturday and Sunday, much, much cooler by next Tuesday, about a 20 degree cool down. For Salt Lake, we also have a really big cool down. Our highs are back into the 30s next week with more areas of rain and snow returning late in the weekend into next week. But for tomorrow, likely snow and breezy, breezy on Saturday, but enjoy the 55 because we've got the cool down coming next week. Well, it doesn't feel like baseball weather, but the Salt Lake Bees will open the season at home tomorrow afternoon. Fox 13's Morgan Vance was at today's media day at Smith's Ballpark. Yeah, when the bees get going tomorrow afternoon, it could look a lot like this. Blustery, wide, and plenty cold. Oh, it's perfect. Like yesterday, it was sunny, then the wind came, and then it snowed overnight. Probably going to be sunny again. You know, it's just, you know, it's spring, spring in Salt Lake. And Keith Johnson would know, beginning his third stint now as skipper of the bees, Johnson leading the Angels AAA affiliate from 2011 to 14, and again between 16 and 18, but after a stint with the Marlins, got the call back. It fits like a glove. You know, it feels like I never left. Um, I love the A. I've always have. I, you know, born and bred. You know, I've made it to the big leagues over here, and I, you know, cut my teeth over here as a manager. So it was, it was, it was kind of a no-brainer. I was told by a high angels person that, you know, lack of structure was a problem here the last couple of years, and so that will not be a problem uh, with Keith at the helm. Expect to see a few familiar names on the opening day roster, along with many new ones, like day one starter Chase Silseth. Really, really excited to just go try to help my team win and compete, compete for them and, you know, start start the season off on a high note with a win. It has a little bit of an old school feel, you know, where, where guys are vested in each other. You know, it's like everybody in there, you know, the position players care about the pitchers, the pitchers care about the position players. You know what I mean? As a manager, I care about every single one of them. One big change this year is the season split into halves. The Pacific Coast League's first half winner to face the winner of half two in the playoffs. With that winner facing the International League champion for the AAA title, come September with the bees Morgan Vance Fox 13 sports it's opening day in Major League Baseball the Yankees at home against the Giants and Yankees slugger Aaron Judge hit the first home run of the season in his first at bat in the first inning after hitting 62 home runs last season the Yankees beat the Giants five to nothing the Utah gymnastics team has advanced in the NCAA championship the Utes were great in the second round Today at UCLA, Miley O'Keefe earned her fourth perfect 10 on the balance beam this season, showing why she's ranked number one in the country in that event. The Red Rocks had another perfect 10 from Jaden Rutger on the vault. She's the defending NCAA champion in that event. The Utes finished first in the group at 198.125. The regional finals are on Saturday. We'll be right back. Thanks for being part of Fox 13 News at 9. Quick cast is up next.